did you all know Netflix has a new animated Tomb Raider series out? <laughs> no, me neither. Now, before we get started, I'm not doing a review of that show. Personally, I couldn't give two flying farts about the plot, storyline, what have you. I have very different interests. In the all-new adventures of everybody's favorite video game femme fatale, Laura Croft, do we get a character inspired by classic video games? <laughs> of course not. Do we get a Laura Croft inspired by Angelina Jolie's interpretation? <laughs> Definitely not. What we get is whatever this is. Blah, take it away. The war on femininity is still ongoing. Academic and corporate feminists, yes, I'm being redundant, are trying to claim another scalp, Laura Croft. But I'm going to explain to y'all why their little project is doomed to failure. They're trying to fight biology itself. I can attack so I cast. Randy, you're trying to impose an unrealistic beauty standard on women and then oppress them by subjecting them to the male gaze. Y'all can bite me. First off, what y'all said is what the great philosopher Dalton described as combining sounds to elicit an emotional response. Nothing more, nothing less. Second, I have this thing called knowledge. I know of what I speak. It just so happens that one of my areas of expertise is aesthetics, the study of beauty. And if y'all haven't figured out at this point, I have strong opinions. But I have and continue to be persuaded to think about beauty in new and different ways all the time. Why? Basic humility. In the 6,000 plus years of recorded history, some of the greatest minds humanity has ever produced all around the world have struggled with this very question, what is beauty? Just a few people who've wrestled with this question from my profession, architecture, Vitruvius, Palladio, Da Vinci, Ruskin, Saradin, Rasmussen, Louis Kahn, I am just scratching the surface of the ink architects have spilled, trying to answer the question, what is beauty? Greeks, Romans, the Renaissance, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Yes, I have examples for Chinese, Japanese, Korean too. It's just the books are too big to hold up. But they all agreed on one thing. The foundation of beauty is mathematics and geometry. In the 1960s, the pioneering work of psychologists like Stephen and Rachel Kaplan argued, well, actually, beauty is hardwired into our cognitive processes. Guess what? Studies into art and architecture that is commonly believed to be beautiful has very consistent mathematical relationships. The human face, the human body, is no different. You keep finding the same mathematical relationships. What's important for this discussion, masculine mathematical relationships are different than feminine mathematical relationships. Masculine beauty is based upon a different mathematical criteria than feminine beauty. There are three important things to remember when evaluating the human form. First off is the ratio of 1 to 0.9. The second is the masculine V, the ratio of shoulders to hips, 1 to 0.9. The third is the feminine hourglass curves and the ratio of bust to waist to hips of 1 to 0.9 to 1. The closer we come to the mathematical ideal, V-shape or hourglass, the larger percentage of people are going to find us physically appealing, attractive, beautiful. However, as I've said before, our physical appearance is just the baseline. There are three more components that go into our evaluation of somebody's beauty. There's the unquantifiable, undefinable it factor, that mysterious thing that makes some people stand out from the crowd. If you have enough it, physical appearance can become irrelevant. Arguably, the most important element is likability. How much you like or dislike somebody directly affects your evaluation of their beauty. And there's also personal preference, what you as the individual like. Tall, short, redhead, brunette, blonde, blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever. 
There is one more element to this equation I haven't talked about too much on this channel, sexual attraction. A very quick recap. There is an objective, mathematically-based standard for beauty, and we are hardwired to seek out that beauty. One of the reasons, there is a correlation between the people we find beautiful and the people we find sexually attractive. Beauty, regular features, good body shape, good skin, good hair, are all markers of good genetics, good health. All things that we as humans find desirable in somebody we want to reproduce with. These are also markers that any children that might come out of this union would also have good genetics, be healthy, be beautiful, and thus have a high likelihood of being able to reproduce themselves. Beautiful people, whether we be talking male or female, are desirable. There's competition for their affections, and beautiful people can afford to be picky when it comes to choosing a mate. There is one more key element in understanding how we are hardwired to seek out beauty. Beauty is a multisensory experience. Like so many different things in life, the masculine multisensory experience of beauty is slightly different than the feminine multisensory experience of beauty. Men emphasize the visual in their experiences of beauty, whereas women emphasize auditory and smell in their experiences. Throughout history, there have been two things that have been used to define a woman's femininity, her hair and her breastuses. And you can tell how much power women have within a society by how much they're allowed to uncover their hair and to uncover their breastuses. Throughout Western culture, again, going back to the Greeks and Romans, it has been believed that men protect culture, women preserve and nurture culture. Women in Western culture have held a great deal of power, and that power has come directly from their femininity. How has Western society shown that women have social power? During cultural rituals and ceremonies, men become the background, they cover up. Women become the foreground, the center of attention, and they uncover. There is a direct correlation between how much power women had in Western society at any given point and exactly how much they uncovered. It doesn't take very much research to find the times in history that women were allowed to go into these rituals and ceremonies completely bare-breasted or at the most thin, very sheer material covering the symbols of their femininity. Women weren't being forced to do this to cater to the male gaze. We'll get to that in a minute. No, on the contrary, this was a raw, naked he <laughs> display of power. By the 1960s, some feminists were making what I would argue was a legitimate point. Thanks to the Victorian era and then the two world wars, women had lost a great deal of power in society. And how this was made manifest? They were being denied their bodies. More specifically, they were being forced to hide their breasts. This was one of the catalysts that led to the end of the Hayes Code, the Hollywood censorship rules that went all the way back to the early 30s. Feminist actresses were demanding the right to be able to go topless in their movies. Leastways on my campus, late 90s, early 2000s, they were still holding bra-burning ceremonies almost on a weekly basis. Young ladies would get up, America denies women their bodies. We should be allowed to go topless. And more than one of these young ladies chose to illustrate her point by going topless. Maybe that's where I got my love of free speech. One of these activist types was a friend of a friend lady I knew in architecture school. We were all hanging around one evening after studio, and she showed up. Now, this activist was a fashionista, always wearing these funky designer dresses. Over the course of the evening, her dress kept getting looser and looser. And of course, she's not wearing a bra. She wasn't wearing any underwear. And every so often, her girls would make an appearance. At one point, I pulled her aside. I didn't want to embarrass her. And I said, you do realize the whole front of your dress keeps opening up? And she looked down and she's like, oh, that's the fashion. It's what it's supposed to do. It's like, um, your girls keep making an appearance. She's like, so? Okay, okay. And I told her, I'm not the type to stare, 
but you keep putting them in my face, and at some point, I am going to look. And she said, as long as you just look, it's okay. Raw, naked, he power. We go back to Laura Croft, a product of the 90s, when feminism was still arguing a woman's curves, in particular her breast, should be on full display. Right around 10 years ago, academic and corporate feminists, thanks to intersectional theory, announced 6,000 plus years of collective human knowledge, 100 plus years of modern science. <laughs> Screw that. We know better. We are going to define feminine beauty because we're tired of catering to the oppressive male gaze. I keep saying that academic and corporate feminism was founded upon a hatred of women. They hate anything feminine. They hate the two historic symbols of femininity, hair and breasts. How do I know? They tell us at every opportunity. Case in point, this article I found in the UK's Guardian justifying and defending the changes to Laura Croft in Netflix's Tomb Raider. Goodbye, cartoon breasts. Hello, sweat stains. The feminist reinvention of Tomb Raider. But Tomb Raider was a feminist invention, which this article acknowledges. So how can you have a feminist reinvention of something that was already a feminist invention? Well, the answer is obvious. The reinvention isn't feminism. Finally, Laura Croft no longer looks like a strong wind would knock her over. Netflix's new animated series boldly reimagines the adventure with no thought to the male gaze. How did Netflix boldly reimagine Laura Croft? They made her a man. Classic V-shaped body, masculine facial features, masculine clothing, even the stance and body language, shoulders back, arms spread, all scream masculine. The breasts. The breasts, Randy. She has breasts. <laughs> Those aren't breasts. Those are pectoral muscles. Least ways, they've been drawn in such a way that the line between breast and pectoral muscle has been blurred. The Guardian article reassures us, no, no, no. This is a much more realistic depiction of a woman's body. And you'll notice the emphasis on those perky, large breasts. <laughs> no, no, no. We must get rid of those. As the article progresses, we see a theme develop. The author seems to be obsessed with lower cross body, thin waist, thin arms and legs, and in particular, those firm, bouncy, gravity-defying large boobies. What the writer is trying to say here? It's disgusting that a woman was drawn with such unrealistic proportions. Either somebody's getting a little turned on here, or they're a whole lot jealous. I'll let you all decide. There are two basic problems with this argument. No, 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 not those two. The first problem, we've already had a live-action adaptation of Laura Croft as portrayed by Angelina Jolie. Small waist. Small arms and legs, firm, bouncy, gravity-defying, large boobies. Check, check, and check. The second problem, the very actress, Haley Atwell, who did the voice for Netflix's Laura Croft. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I see small waist, small arms, firm, bouncy, gravity-defying, large breastesses. All this is a bit superfluous as far as the writer's concerned because the important thing, Netflix's Laura Croft covers everything up with comfortable cargo pants and a high neck tank top. The title of this article and its subtitle sum up everything that's been going on. In Western culture, the last 500 years minimum, and there are those who argue it goes way further back than that, a woman's breast symbolized her femininity, and the ability to show her breast symbolized her position of power within society. Within the last 10 years, academic and corporate feminists, thanks to intersectional theory, have suddenly decided, no, the only legitimate power is masculine power. So the female breast, the symbol of feminine power, not allowed anymore. 
And if you do have breasts, they better be covered up. We see this attack on breasts everywhere. Study shows poor, uneducated, stupid, unsophisticated, dirty, and they're probably bigots too. Men like big breasts, whereas wealthy, smart, educated, sophisticated men who have all the right opinions love small boobs. This is hogwash, 100% horse hockey. There is only one thing that determines if a person likes large boobs, small boobs, or boobs at all. Personal preference. The upcoming video game Dragon Age Veilguard is very proud to announce you can create a character that has top surgery scars, but you cannot create a female character that has breast sizes larger than A cup. Breasts are now verboten. And what's used to justify all this nonsense? Women shouldn't be forced to cater to the male gaze. Outside of sounds being combined to elicit an emotional reaction, what exactly does the male gaze mean? Because once you think it through, it's stupid and evil. Let's talk a little human psychology here for a bit. I'm going to pop some people's bubbles, but what I'm about to say is not controversial in any way, shape, or form, at least ways until a couple years ago. Outside of the ideologues, what I'm saying is accepted science. When humans choose a partner, and it doesn't matter if we're talking a short-term liaison or a long-term commitment, 95% of the time plus, the woman makes the first move. How? Go to any place where there's a large group of available men and women and then sit back and watch. Specifically, watch the women. You'll figure out what's going on pretty quick. If a woman spots a man she wants to talk to, the first thing she will do, the laugh. She'll suddenly become animated, start talking louder, laughing louder, making much broader hand gestures. It's the social equivalent of, over here, look over here. She'll try to establish eye contact and then coyly look away. You'll get the ear tuck. You'll get the hair twist, all signaling, I'm receptive to you coming talking to me. The next step is what's called the parade. She'll suddenly need to go to the bathroom, need to go get her coat, go search her purse, go talk to a friend over there. All an excuse to go walking by, usually at a slower pace, the guy she's interested in. At this point, unless the guy is completely clueless, oh, no, I don't know anybody that fits that description, why do you ask? He would realize, hey, I think she wants me to talk to her. And at this point, he has a decision to make. Should he approach the woman? But if he does, he's going to face the real possibility of rejection. This is not a done deal by any stretch of the imagination. Way more than 50% of the time, something's going to go wrong. The way the guy smells, the sound of his voice, his body language, a million different things can be potentially off-putting, and the woman will send him on his way. More often than not, she'll be nice about it, but she'll still send him on his way. And the rejection, no matter how nicely done, is still a rejection. How does the man decide to take the risk to approach the woman knowing more often than not, he's going to fail? He's going to be rejected. Unless the man already knows the woman, he only has one set of facts to work with. Her physical appearance, how beautiful he thinks she is. There is a reason why men are visual. Our ability to reproduce is entirely dependent upon our ability to make sound decisions based solely upon visual information. Guess what? From time immemorial, women have known this. They know their ability to reproduce is directly related to their ability to communicate through visual information alone. A woman has to be so good at visual communication, she can convince a man to risk the high possibility of rejection on the off chance this is the one. How does a woman go about doing that? Making herself look as appealing, as beautiful as possible. That's the entire purpose of the walk. 
shoulders back, breasts out, hips swaying. Woman's trying to show off her curves in their best light. The woman has done everything she can, presented herself in the best light possible. She's as beautiful as she knows how to be. What's the final piece of the puzzle? The thing that causes a guy to take the risk to go talk to her. <laughs> Personal preference. And again, women know this. Like attracts like. Women present themselves in a manner that will attract the type of man they want to attract. This is why I keep talking about feminine power. In a society where people choose their own partners, women are in control from top to bottom. There's one more wrinkle to this equation. Women dress to attract men, but they also dress to impress other women. A man's evaluation of a woman's beauty is straightforward and rather binary. Like, don't like. A woman's evaluation of another woman's beauty has more depth and it's a lot harsher. At the end of the day, they're in competition with each other. Academic and corporate feminists are trying to convince heterosexual women that the male gaze of heterosexual men is a bad thing. They should not attract it under any circumstance. They're trying to convince the group of people who initiate 95% plus of all romantic relationships from stop having romantic relationships. They're trying to convince heterosexual women from having relationships and sexual relations with heterosexual men. <laughs> we'll see how that works out for y'all. Why would these feminists work so hard to destroy women's lives, destroy the traditional symbol of femininity, the breast? Power. I'm going to tell y'all a story. I've told this story before, but it bears repeating. My department got a new professor. She was very mousy, hair in a rat's nest bun, oversized glasses, the only makeup she'd ever wear, little eye makeup, some foundation, loose cardigans, long skirts, practical shoes, flats or sneakers. I always thought she had really nice bone structure. She put a little effort into it. She would be a very good looking woman. A bunch of PhD students, grad students went out for drinks one night after school. She showed up. The problem? No one recognized her. She was dressed up for the evening. High heels, stockings, pretty dress, fancy hairstyle, and makeup. She was hot. We're talking like a nine. And more importantly for this story, she had boobs. Nice boobs. She ended up hanging out with us for the evening. She had a drink. A couple older guys came over, asked her to dance. She actually went home before we did. She didn't act inappropriately in any way, shape, or form. One of the women in our group ran back to the department to snitch. She told all the female faculty, you know that mousy new professor we got? Well, actually, she's hot and she has curves. The lemon-faced harridans within the department went nuts. They did everything in their power bullied, lied, spread the most vile, vicious rumors, everything to make this woman's life a living hell and to destroy her career. The poor thing didn't make it to the end of the year. She was gone. It was also the last time that little snitch hung out with our group. Why did the lemon-faced harridans go nuts? Power. The little professor had more feminine power than they did and they couldn't let that abide. These academic and corporate feminists love the power that Western society grants them because they're women, but they resent the fact that there are other women who are more beautiful, more attractive, more desirable than them, have more feminine power than they do. They further resent the power that Western society grants them the social position they get from that power that is granted them and their very safety is dependent upon those women who have more feminine power than they do, who they resent for that feminine power in the first place. Quite the web of resentment they've created for themselves. And what's the symbol of all this resentment? The breast. The one thing they either don't have or if they do have them, no one's interested. Academic and corporate feminism solution to all this resentment? 
only recognize the legitimacy of masculine power. Convince those who hold feminine power to voluntarily give up that power and to erase the female breast from Western culture. A lot of people have talked about the cycle. Academic corporate feminists hate men. Therefore, they hate the things that men like, which is women. So therefore, they hate women. They got that backwards. The priority, the emphasis is not the hatred of men. It is the hatred of women. Back when I was working on my dissertation, I knew a lady who was a sex counselor. <laughs> when you study aesthetics, it can take you all sorts of weird places. Well, at least it took me to some weird places. She asked me at one point if I was interested in attending one of her seminars. I was like, sure, why not? At one point during the presentation, she says to all the women in the audience, if you're a feminist, you will never do this, 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 this. I'm thinking, well, there goes all the fun stuff. Afterwards, she came up to me and said, what'd you think? I said, I can think of a lot of religions, ideologies, who have a reputation for being sexually repressive, who would agree with everything you just said. The Victorians just called. They said, lighten up, will you? I said, you don't approve of female sexuality. She said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. I listed off everything she said a feminist should not do. And I asked, what's left? What's left? Become a man. I took my family to the Texas State Fair this week, and I saw on display for all the world to see more feminine curves of every shape, size, color, age than you can imagine. I didn't know that there were that many pairs of yoga pants in the world. Bare midriffs, bare shoulders, cleavage, sometimes a lot of cleavage. You know what they say, everything in Texas is bigger? Well, apparently that includes the breasts as well. You get away from academia, Hollywood, Southern California, there are a lot of women who realize they have a great deal of feminine power, and as far as they're concerned, the only way you're going to take it from them is from their cold, dead hands. Convincing heterosexual women to give up having sex with men? <laughs> Good luck with that. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about, and until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And maybe consider becoming a channel member. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.